This is Dan Limmer, founder of Limmer Creative. I'm here today with Bill Brown, former director of the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians. And the segment we're doing today is called Five Tough Questions. You've hopefully listened to our previous podcasts. And what we did is in, in our detailed review of the product, we went through and culled some questions that we thought might be extra challenging to users of the app. Now, remember, Bill's theory in creating this app was not to make it at the level of knowledge, it was to rise above, that if students know it really well and a little bit above, then they will really be able to do well on the exam. That leads to having some questions in there that are going to make people, quite frankly, scratch their heads. But this experience will be essential for success on that national certification exam. So first, I'll welcome Bill. Hello again. Hi, Dan. We're ready to go, man. Yes, we are. All right, I'm just going to read the question, and here we go. A drowsy 19-year-old male was stabbed with a knife over the left side of his anterior chest. His skin is cool and clammy. His vitals are blood pressure 104 on 82, pulse of 118, respiratory rate of 22, and his oxygen saturation is 94% on room air. What type of shock is he suffering? And the choices are metabolic, cardiogenic, hypovolemic, and distributive. So one of the reasons that I like this question is that it didn't seem like the average question you'd get in class. It really requires you to know types of shock and to be able to evaluate this patient presentation and know about it. Yet, there are some clear indications on what the right answer is if you know how to apply that information. Well, there are, and um, you got the four different types of shock. I mean, I think there's some even people will classify them as different ways, but you have four choices here. The correct answer is cardiogenic, and the reason is is that there's something going on with the heart in this situation, and it's even though it sounds like it could be a blood loss, and it there is some blood loss, what you have is pericardial tamponade going on. That's not three liters of blood or two liters of blood. That's just a little bit, but it's not allowing the ventricles to fill up to their full capacity of 70 milliliters and pumping out right here 118 times a minute. So this person's uh, starting to have signs and symptoms of shock and a little bit of a narrow pulse pressure. So it's a little early in the event here. You know, most 19-year-old people who get stabbed don't wait around for an hour to call 911. Somebody says, oh, gripe, this is in the left side of the chest. They're going to call 911 pretty quick. The answer is cardiogenic. Now, it's a tough question because most people think trauma is strictly hypovolemic. But this is the heart that's causing the problem with the hypoperfusion, not the loss of the volume. So you could call it tough. I don't think it's a tough question. I know the answer. So when I know the answer, I don't think it's hard at all. (laughs) I would doubt that many people will pick metabolic and distributive, but... This is a pump failure issue. Okay, it started by trauma, but again, it's a pump failure issue. And so the pump is called the heart. We refer to that as cardio. So it's cardiogenic shock, and that's clear to me. And in the question, if a student were to, to read this, what are the points they should pick out? Now, it's very clear that stabbed with a knife over the left side. Right, of it's right over his heart. Right, yeah, so that's yeah, going involve yeah, the heart. Yeah. Anything else that yeah, you Yeah, the heart's a little bit of it. It's not way back. I mean, to stab somebody in the chest and hit their aorta, the thoracic aorta is in the back. Whoa. I mean, I appreciate that there's a, a lot of vessels in the chest. If you get stabbed on the right side, you might hit a pretty good pulmonary artery, but that'll still take some time to exsanguinate. We get some signs and symptoms here that are representative of, you know, narrow pulse pressure, representative of something going on in the chest. I think, to me, that stabbed over the left side of the chest makes me think in an anatomical way, what's behind that? And that's always just like getting shot in the right upper quadrant. you got this big, massive, vascular liver. You know, you got to be thinking about What's behind that? And to me, that's why it's cardiogenic, and that little clue is helpful in this question. Right, and I think we've talked before that these questions are never going to give you a ton of information. They're going to be relatively, you know, we're looking at two, three 
sentences, you know, that they're going to be... The questions that are in the app, yeah, of course. I wanted to, like I said before, I wanted to stress them out. And I think that this one has a debrief on it. You know, it might be very similar to what we just talked about here. And there's some learning here about a left-sided anterior chest knife in there, pull it back out. You go right through the ventricle, and you're going to get some bleeding into the pericardial sac. But, you know, it doesn't just burst out like a balloon that you blew up with too much pressure. So it's going to hold that blood in the pericardial sac, and you're not going to get a huge volume loss type of situation. To me, that's the best answer. It's Seb, the best. Seb wounds are a little more notorious for tamponade than other types of wounds. I mean, Seb right, wounds yeah. is how you get mm-hmm. All right, Bill, question number two. A 62-year-old man with a history of heart disease complains of chest pain. He tells you he's been prescribed nitroglycerin. You should first auscultate his lung sounds, administer oxygen by non-rebreather mask, prepare the AED, or establish a set of vital signs. Well, the right answer is to establish a set of vital signs. You can't give nitroglycerin if you don't know the person's blood pressure and heart rate. He tells you he has it. My guess is he's probably taken some already. That's not in the stem. That's not, don't add information and don't start asking about this and that. Here's what you got. That's it. You have to deal with this. So he's taking nitro and we don't have an SpO2 reading. So we don't really know if his reading is below 94% and he could use some oxygen you know, that gets back to this whole oxygen is good. Well, yeah, it's good, but it can be problematic, too, with the release of free ad- radicals, etc., which is pretty heavy physiology, but it is something that I think a lot of EMT instructors aren't teaching now about the withholding of oxygen patients. So we don't have that, so we can't pick that. And a conscious patient shouldn't have an AED, so preparing it, I mean, does it take like 30 minutes for you to do that? So that's not it. And auscultating his lung sounds. Oh, well, yeah. That's, you're, you pick that. You're really way out of left field. It's not invalid to do. It's just not no, what you do first. No, 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 no. It says you should first. Right. So the first thing you do is if you're thinking about giving somebody nitros, get a set of vital signs. So in this, the right. thought process should be AED is ridiculous because he's talking to you. The lung sounds are, are okay, but not first. Right. And that brings you down to the oxygen by non-rebreather mask and establish a set of vital signs. And I do think that that mantra of oxygen, the wonder drug, is still out there. And I think you have to caution people against that now because not only is practice changing, but the exam has changed to reflect that as well. It's just... Oh, it changed a couple years ago. And uh, unfortunately, that doesn't mean the instructor changed their lesson plans or read the AHA guidelines. But even then, he tells you you've been prescribed nitro. Well, you know how we are. We want to help patients assist them with their medications, but don't be given nitro without taking vital signs. Right. And I think I'll just add at the end is that a lot of times people read the stem, you know, the part of the question that explains what's going on, and they think what they do first, then they freak because what they would do first isn't there. They have four choices, and they have to evaluate those four choices. Yeah, that's it. Which one of these are you going to do first? No, 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 that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. Or they'll say... Well, why didn't they tell me this, and why didn't they tell me this, and why didn't they tell me that? And easily we could have added all that in there. What we should have done on the app is had uh, established a set of vital signs and had it blink. You know, boing, 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 boing. In other words, like... Big red arrow. Yeah, red, big red arrow. Yeah, like that isn't how it's supposed to be. This is a challenge for you and your knowledge and your application of the knowledge. So there right. it is right there, there established a set of vital signs. All right, question number three. I'll just read it now. A violent 81-year-old man with a history of Alzheimer's needs to be transported because he is short of breath and has an SpO2 of 85% on room air. You should approach him from two sides to restrain him, move him to the ground to control him, apply oxygen to improve his hypoxia, or have three partners to restrain him. You know, this is a choice question, but I think the key is that it says a violent 81-year-old man. Now, come on, 81? I'm not really worried about his right cross. I would imagine it's pretty weak. But I still don't need a fat lip or a nose dislocated or busted. So the right answer is 
to restrain him. Now, I totally appreciate that applying oxygen to improve his hypoxia is my goal. But I'm not going to get to that goal if I don't restrain him. The violent guy is not going to let you put the oxygen on to help him. No, no, he won't, he won't do it. So, you know, moving him to the ground, uh, you know, you could do that too. It's not as good as the therapy of using the proper techniques to restrain somebody. I mean, it's dangerous, you know, it's tack- dangerous too. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah well, if you tackle them, I mean, you know, they're right there in the nursing home. I'm not sure that your fire chief or your supervisor is not going to get a call about, you know, Joe Dumas who came in and tackled the patient there would, to there get him would, to the ground. There would be 80, a flag. This 81-year-old guy who probably has, uh, you know, osteoporosis of the bones and they're all going to bust and everything. But you could do that. It's I mean, safe to say there'd be a flag on the Yeah, there'd be a flag. Yes, yeah, so sure, it's, yeah. it's a bad choice. It's bad a choice. Bad, okay. bad choice. Right. And approach him from two sides to restrain him. Well, that's kind of nice too, but in the EMT literature, we talk about proper restraining and you say you need four people, one for each limb. That doesn't mean you have to call for a backup either. You got probably other people around there that can help you. Yeah, you know, I try to talk the guy down for a while, but it says he's violent. Right. I get violence, man. He's he's hypoxic too. I gotta I gotta make some right. moves here. It's so, time to do something. Yeah, yeah. Well what about the people that are gonna look at this? Now we we talked in the last question about well the right answer isn't there. People say, Well, I would back out and wait for the police, you know, the whole scene safety thing. Um, what would you say to that? Well, go ahead, and I just hope that because he's 81 years old and he has a bunch of comorbidity that he doesn't infarct on you while you screw around. This guy needs oxygen. I'm really proud of you getting his SpO2 on this violent guy. That was pretty tough to do in the first place. Yeah. But you got that. <laughs> but the information is there. So you got you that. Know, I, think, I think that people have a lot of mantras they stick with. Oxygen is one, and scene safety is one. And what happens is people take these things and they apply them in the same way across every call. No, no. And that's not the way that's not the way it works in the field or the exam, yeah. quite frankly. In here, you don't have the choice to say that. The, the, there is, in spite of the fact you might not have the choice you want, there's a rational approach is to have three partners restrain him. It gives you the most number of people. Yeah. And that gives you the ability to apply the oxygen. But I think yeah. in this case, one of the keys is is that you're going to have to look at the word violent. And, you know, Alzheimer's patients, there's some of them that are what they'll call pleasant Alzheimer's. And, you know, they're just kind of nice. They don't know all their memories gone. And then there's those that would take a swing at you as soon as you get too close. So the staff at a nursing home where you might, or assisted living place, they'll probably know that. And here it is stated right there. Watch out for this guy. He's violent. But he's hypoxic. Somehow I figured out that he's got 85% SpO2. Ooh, I got to restrain this guy. But we all know that the staff at some of these facilities are right on the ball. So they, oh yeah, but they, they know at least got yeah, that. Yeah, they know these. They know these patients. All right. So I think that was a good one because we talked about the important parts of the question and how to go through and choose the best of the answers that are there. It's really about reading the question. There's one that. word in there: violent. One and word. If you didn't read that, you're going to be thinking 85 oxygen. Uh oh. I wonder how many. Read each word and read it carefully. Yeah, I have a couple of these. It's been one word that's made the decision. Oh, or yeah. the left stab in the left chest. Right. You know, there's one part. And if you don't read these carefully, yeah, you're, you're going to lose. Yeah, you're going to lose. All right, question number four. An 89-year-old diabetic woman is unable to smile and has right arm drift. Her vital signs are blood pressure 138 on 86, pulse of 88, Respiration 16, and her SpO2 is 95% on room air. You should first administer oral glucose, prepare for rapid transport, administer oxygen by non-rebreather mask, or assess her mental status. There was a big argument about whether EMT should be able to use glucometers or not in 2004 when they put the education standards together, and they said no because of all the different devices and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not going to get into that argument, but I got a diabetic person who's showing some signs of stroke. And to me, I don't know what her blood sugar is, so I'm just going to give her a little bit of oral glucose and see if that resolves those signs and symptoms. And then, because the withhold it just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, she's well oxygenated, so I don't have to worry about hypoxia. She's got a good blood pressure, so she's not dehydrated. And 
Maybe she has a stroke, but she's diabetic. So I think you got to give her oral glucose. Now, you, everybody has local protocols and of course. medical directors, and so they might debate this question. Fine. Uh, that's why they're challenging. I want people to go into discussions about these questions. I think that why the other ones are less correct is, is also important. Yeah, that's right. And the, the prepare for rapid transport means that you just didn't even think that maybe this diabetes is uh, presenting itself with stroke-like symptoms. I think just ignoring that is problematic. Uh, giving oxygen by an unrebreather mask, well, her, her SpO2 is 95%. So, again, we got that free radical discussion and... Why would you give her oxygen? There's just no indication here. Especially by non-rebreather. Yeah, right, yeah. And, and then assessing her mental status, well, you kind of somewhat did that when you did the, she's unable to smile and has right arm drift. You know, mental status, I think, is an underappreciated uh, assessment that uh, really needs to be well taught to EMTs, and it's just not right now. But given these four choices, you should first... I, I say give her the oral glucose, I mean, you know, and see what happens. Well, and I think going through a student's head in this will be, hopefully they've been, they've been taught, at least know the general thought that a lot of sugar, in a, if it is a stroke, probably isn't good. Well, well, yeah, a whole big bolus of D50 like a paramedic would do is, I don't know how much oral glucose raises uh, somebody's blood sugar level from, let's say, 30 to 120, but... What we could do, Dan, is overdose you with insulin and keep checking your glucometer. When it gets to be 30, we'll shoot a whole tube in there, and then we'll <laughs> see how it improves. Now, I don't think any um, IRB would approve that study. Um, we can't experiment on human beings, but this is not going to turn her into hyperglycemia for three days. Where It's just something that could possibly resolve her symptoms and you believe it's yeah. the better of the choices? yeah i do i do the yeah. better of all yeah, of those I do. choices yeah i do yeah and now if your medical director doesn't agree with me then don't give her oral glucose but you know i wrote the test i so i have to defend the questions and my defense is that's what i would do and so be it so be it well i think this really shows that the national certification exam can't match every state's and region's protocols. You well, really that, have to be protocol that, neutral. This kind of a item, you and I debated it, and which is why we picked it out here. That's the beauty of this app, in my opinion. It's very, very, very comprehensive and puts you at the horns of the dilemma about what you're going to do and causes you to have a discussion with your instructor and your medical director and everybody in your system and to review your protocols. And I'm glad if that's one of the outcomes, even if your outcome is not to administer oral glucose, because maybe this question wouldn't even make it on the registry exam. I don't know. I didn't submit it as a candidate, because if I would have, wouldn't be I good. wouldn't be here. Right. Right. So that's it. All right. So getting a, a dialogue is a very mature approach to this. I mean, that, that it's not that this is teaching you everything. This is understanding what you may perceive as an ambiguity or, or a difference in things, you can look at that and still try and filter through and make the best of the choices with the information you get, even if the one you really want isn't there. Oh, Dan, Dan, I'll say in this app there are a good number of questions that should create a dialogue about local policies and local protocols. And, man, aren't we here to improve patient care and improve EMS? And so if Bill Brown wrote a question and he thinks this is the right answer and it's not in your area, that helped improve EMS and, by the way, your knowledge. Yeah, you'll you'll learn a lot from this. Yep. Um, That was a good one. All right, question number five and the last one. A 56-year-old man is having chest pain. He is cold and clammy and short of breath. His vital signs are blood pressure 116 on 86. The pulse is 56 and irregular. Respirations are 16. You should first. Remind me to come back and talk about the you should, you should first, and you should next. We should talk about that. Let me give you the the choices here. Administer oxygen by non-rebreather mask. Determine his pulse oximeter reading. Determine if he has been prescribed nitroglycerin. And administer oxygen, four liters per minute, by nasal cannula. 
Okay, this is a really... <laughs> we, saved a tough, it for, we saved it for last. This is a very tough question because uh, it gets at a lot of different points. And he has symptoms. He does. So he's not having chest pain. There's no pulse oximeter reading on this guy, which I would love to have. But it's not in the stem. But what am I going to first do? And that's give him oxygen, four liters by nasal cannula. And, and that really came right out of the AHA algorithm on acute coronary syndromes. The non-rebreather mask, that's that over-oxygenation of people. And in uh, 1994, when the education curriculum was put together, it was 100% breathers on everybody. Then in 2000, the Heart Association went to nasal cannulas, and hardly anybody knew that. And in 2010, they said, oh, not even no oxygen unless the SpO2 is below 94. And so the people that are picking oxygen administration by non-rebreather mask or just only 15 years behind the times. We sat actually for a while and talked about this and pulled out the standards and found a sentence. I yeah, mean, right, yeah. The correct choice on this is directly from those guidelines. Right. And I do believe that your statement um, either earlier here or in a different uh, podcast about people not taking those guidelines and the CPR and resuscitation and those things seriously are a major issue. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's I agree. Now, determining his pulse oximeter reading... That's a good one. I like that. But I wouldn't do that first. Determine if he has been prescribed nitroglycerin is another very good choice because he's 56. He's having chest pain. We don't know if this is his first episode or he's had, you know, atherosclerotic disease for a while, stents in place, all different kinds of things, and he probably has nitro, but we don't know that. But it says first. So it should say you should first. Now, if it says you should next, that would mean that probably in the stem some things were done. Right. So we're looking for an algorithmic approach to taking care of patients, and you have to look at what, what did I do already and what, what am I, I going to do next. You know, this is well explained. You know, if you should, that means that pretty much one of the answers is the best choice, and the other ones are not good choices. This is where everything might be right. I mean, getting the pulse oximeter and finding out if he has been prescribed nitroglycerin are right. They're just not ahead of giving this guy oxygen. They're just not. We talked about low it. flow, by the way. Right. Not, uh, we talked about this a lot. Yeah. And I think that the, you should first is the, is the key here. The other thing I think that's important is, is that we have said that oxygen should be administered to patients that are symptomatic, even if their pulse oximetry is okay. Right. And there yeah. are certain patients right. that will get it. Right. And that's what sold me on this. And then when we looked at the guidelines... They don't say blast people with oxygen and see how they do. They say start with a cannula and titrate it up if necessary. Right, that's right. So here you have a guy that is apparently, you know, responsive. So we're going to put that cannula on first because we know he's going to get oxygen. Right. So, so put it on like they say and then check. And then if you have to bump it up, bump it up. So I want to tell you that while it took us uh, 26 minutes to go over these five questions, this is how hard it is to write them. Oh, we had fun. I mean, you know, fun. when you're, you're, we're just talking about five. Writing this question and getting a stem and making sense of it and then figuring out what's not in the stem and then what would people bite on and what is the right answer and what would you do first? That's why I said it. You can only do three questions an hour. That's it. Yeah, to, to get them like this. And That's I think that they're hard. this is probably one of the tougher questions only because I think you'd say, well, gee, I want to do non-rebreather. But then you say, well, if, gee, if I had his, his oximeter reading, his, his SATs, I could make the right decision. Yeah. But in reality, he's going to get it anyway. And current oxygen thinking is, is you start low and work up, right, yeah. high and work down. You're correct, yeah. And I think that's a good point. Right. Yep. All right. We are now almost to a half an hour. We try to keep these short. But I, I had a blast yeah. not only going over these questions. The ability to sit with Bill Brown and argue questions is an experience that I wish everyone could have. It was really a, a great thing to do. And I think it leads to a, a great product. That product uh, is EMT Pass. Not that, that each one is something you're going to agree with. But I don't think anyone has ever left the national certification exam and said, I agree with everything there, too, that we want to create good thinking and applying providers that apply their knowledge. And I think that's what we've done. And we hope that going over these questions uh, have done that. So for Limmer Creative, uh, LimmerCreative.com, uh, I'm Dan Limmer, the founder of the company. And for Bill Brown, um, thank you for listening. And we'll talk to you on the next podcast.